Okay, I think um, let's start again after the lunch. I think um, uh, let's catch back. I think there was a good question from uh, Anna about a interesting thing. Uh, I think we need to talk about. That is my uh, my yeah. No, I found it here. So uh, she mentioned about an interesting uh, topic about some measuring some real sample. And I thought maybe useful to for everybody. So instead of going one by one, let's just go to the... So her question was from here, like what happened? Like um, if you keep sending you like infrared uh, UV or visible light, um, uh, what's going to happen of the material? Because uh, her question was whether material gets damaged. Think about your measuring a, a liquid. Um, with some um, uh, organic compounds in it. And uh, what happens after you send the light, what's going to happen to the material? Do you have to change it or it will be, uh, can be reusable? Because you know, you don't want to, um, so the question is, then I was kind of alluding that what you do is excite the electron and then electron absorb that photon as long as it matches the energy uh, definition of um, light and the energy it needs to jump from the ground state to the excited state. But what happens is it cascades down, means the electron doesn't stay there forever because that is the nature of the universe. The universe never likes excited state, always, like we all have inertia, we always go to the ground state. So it, it comes back to the ground state through those vibrational states. We all, you make the molecule shake up, so basically heat up. So your molecule will be heated up before or after irradiation of the light. Make sense? Because ultimately you gave an energy, so energy has to go somewhere. So that energy being absorbed by the electron, go to the excited state, and the electron has to come back. It cannot stay in excited state. It will eventually come back and keep losing energy through uh, these uh, vibrational resonances, and you uh, increase the temperature of your molecule. But there is a corollary. But now if you give very high energy photon, your, your electron not only goes to a conduction band, it goes to a vacuum level. Means the electron completely comes out of the molecule. Then you permanently change. You bleach it. That's how you see bleaching. Your, our cloth fades, this is bleaching. Because of the, if you keep it on the sun drying over again and again, uh, that happened that your electrons completely change. Whole electronic structure is not changed. You don't have that electronic structure anymore. So most cases, uh, what we observe that if you really give a very deep UV light, uh, sometimes you're damaged. So now question is how deep is too deep? It depends on what material you are studying and what light you're exciting. So you, you don't want to excite with a very high energy photon where you know that band gap is only about say uh, 1 EV or 2 EV and you're exciting with a 5 EV light or X-ray light and then you actually bombard damage the material. So as long as you don't do that, you are stay within this relation that you excite enough an electron still within the crystal, you know, the conduction bands is still part of the lattice, means electrons still attracted and circulating across the ionic core. So it is still in the lattice. So you, as long as you don't give enough energy to completely knock it out of the lattice, it will come back and, and you will heat up the, and the, the extra energy actually goes into heating up the, and there's a lot of process called OJ recombinations and um, various recombination process takes place how electron comes back to the ground state. So that's something I thought maybe uh, that material doesn't change unless you really use a very high energy light to make the electron jump out. So now um, uh, while uh, this interesting topic will be coming uh, in a minute, uh, should I maybe go that way so that people has better so this is uh, another new type of spectroscopy that is the most predominant uh, spectroscopic technique uh, called infrared uh, spectroscopy but called Fourier transform. So we'll, we'll, in a minute we'll talk about why this Fourier transform kind of needed. Uh, I think I'd, instead of going back to the original slide uh, each time, so uh, that's our normal spectroscopy. This is your light bulb, that's a lie and then you focus the beam um, and then um, you put a prism in it and you create different color, different direction. 
that's RGB. So that's the good color combination I chose so that this is actually whole visible spectrum. And then you make them go through, uh, there is a sample, there is a slit with a pinhole that's open and you just move the slit and make that light go through and you put a photo detector this is your PD photo detector you measure it so you select red green blue and that's what you do but now you can imagine that if I need lots of wavelength this mechanism quite clumsy I cannot generate many wavelengths with this prism mechanism because if I think about infrared I go from say 800 nanometer all the way say I'm going to 20 micron that's kind of practical range if I have to go such a wide uh, wavelength range, this mechanism is very clumsy, you cannot have enough separation of light, cannot generate enough. So this is not a very good mechanism. So just to set the tone, why we need that. So now uh, going back to infrared, uh, why infrared? That most molecule actually has some vibration and was morning was talking about that uh, instead of electronic absorption. Now, what is the key point? We go from first we did this UV visible spectroscopy where we did this, make a material transition across this uh, band gap. That's called electronic absorption. Now we'll go through that, no, my photons are much weaker. So this is my, has to, photon has to match this gap. That my H nu. So my H nu should be almost proportional to delta E. But what if my H nu is weak? My H nu is not strong enough, so, so that's not enough. And so material, it cannot excite material. Most material will not be, that is typically the range I was mentioning about say 800 nanometer all the way say 20 micron, or you can continue to go to 100 micron, but that's more practical range. So this energy is not enough to make electronic transition. So basically I cannot do spectroscopy, light will not be absorbed here with this electronic transition mechanism. So what we will be looking at called vibrational resonances, like a, um, this is very common, right? This is, we all know, this is my H2O. And it is actually a structure like that. So, so they actually, this bond actually stretches and bends and they're it, easy to polarize because of the reason. And, and that is the reason we use microwave. So microwave actually sends a very weak energy, not even that, much smaller energy, and it makes the water molecule rotate. And if you can experiment, you take a very dry empanada, put it on a microwave, you'll see it burn out because there's no water molecule. So microwave efficiency depends on water molecule because water has to rotate. So that's how you heat up. So you need a moisture to effectively use microwave. Anytime you try dry material, put some peanuts, you'll see fire coming out because water molecule cannot rotate very well in a dry matrix. So just giving a point that now we switch gear from electronic transition to a more of a rotation and vibrational based spectroscopy. That's how the infrared spectrum will be. <coughs> so, um, so that's what we'll be doing, that we can uh, characterize wide range of spectrum and molecule just uh, in the studying the vibrational, rotational um, bonds. Uh, so basically, again, I was mentioning the bond specific. So basically bond you can probe like a, uh, between, very, and we'll see in a minute that you can probe various stretching and bending and the vibration of the bonds. And that allows us to really go across the spectrum as mentioning uh, far into the infrared domain in using this infrared spectroscopy. But now, yeah, that's kind of, uh, again, these vibrational molecules or bonds are very unique. To give an example, this is a wavelength, again, uh, chemist-like wave number, which is inverse of wavelength. So this is a wave number, but you can assume this is inverse of wavelength, so one by lambda. And that's my absorption. Uh, and then, and you can see that this is a polycarbonate. And polycarbonate has a very specific band means it is very unique. The each resonance is matches with polycarbonate. But you can now measure other molecule. You may make, you can see maybe some of the peaks may be there, but it cannot have all the, all the resonances, like our fingerprint. Like your ticker palm is very unique. Your retina scan is very unique. Your thumb is very unique. That's why you go to USA, they will scan everything. They will scan hand, scan every possible matrix they will scan because that makes you unique. So this is a unique infrared vibrational resonances you can um, measure uh, 
through um, uh, very compound molecules. So now question is, uh, those molecules don't have a band gap in the visible domain. So we cannot use UV spe or visible UV V spectroscopy for those. Uh, compound molecules. So then we are talking about because they're band gap like this, and we're we're trying to probe a wide spectral range. So energy is not enough for like this mechanism. We'll be exciting vibrational of bonds. So we're, we're, we'll be probing the bonds. So the question is now you can identify or you call molecular fingerprint of almost all molecule just based on their uh, fingerprinting. Hey, just to show some example, but again, we will not go back talk about the origin of the. That's a very original Parkin Elmer uh, dispersive one. Means again this mechanism. So that's the mechanism. You take instead of uh, your visible domain, you take a normal bulb also has a lot of infrared light and use infrared uh, uh, design prism and you separate uh, instead of visible light, infrared light. And you can already see that that mechanism will be very clumsy. I'm doing, trying to do same thing, separating the wavelength with a grating or uh, thing is, doesn't do very well. So people clever way of designed another mechanism called Fourier transfer infrared spectroscopy. Uh, I think again into the 80s and 70s and that's what we'll be talking about this is same mechanism like UV uh, vis uh, but uh, again never nobody used after maybe uh, 70s or around that time so now what is a FTIR uh, so the point here is that instead of uh, uh, the sequentially illuminating the sample so we can I'll post the I'll give the slide back to um, Anna and you guys can be get a copy to read yourself at your time. But just the key point is that this dispersive based mechanism that you need to have a light uh, broadband source and separate into um, many wavelengths doesn't not a very effective mechanism because you have to separate into so many wavelengths and then measure one after one after one after one. It's not very uh, uh, effective um, uh, mechanism doing it. Those. Instead of that, we'll be doing some interferometric technique that light, again we'll explain what is interferometric technique we'll be doing. So the plan is a light uh, goes through interferometer and we will send the interferogram and again we'll go back in a minute to the sample and then whatever light comes back we'll do Fourier transform it. So that will be our today's uh, one hour exercise to understand. So point is that we'll send a broadband light but interferogram it of that and in a minute we'll explain and do a Fourier transform. Again let's not I think unless we define that. Um, uh, so just to say why, because it's better to ask the question why at the beginning uh, to create expectation. So you have to ask the question why I should do that. Like somebody asked you to do why this. So better to ask the why. So much faster uh, because you don't need to scan individual wavelengths uh, like a normal dispersive, like a prism or grating we did. Like you have to move this lead across one by one by one. You don't have to do anything like that. Um, and then also uh, that is very high signal to noise ratio because of the, f the way the path lengths in interferometer is measured using a laser that the path lengths are measured very precisely that uh, we can actually know the wavelength much accurately. Now, comp now think about that here wavelength only by known by movement of this uh, slit. The slit kind of moving across. This is goes up and down. So in location, I need to know exact location that this is exactly here with a precise. then I know this is blue color. If my location, knowledge of location is little off, then I may not know who is what blue because blue also has a distribution. So I'm looking at a blue, green and red. This is my this. So I need to exactly know the location of my pinhole to know this is exactly blue. So I'm saying this is quite um, uh, already has some inaccuracy uh, inbuilt. Um, uh, into that and we'll see that uh, the FTIR has much more uh, robust um, and accurate. Uh, just to again set that we'll, we'll fall back a little later uh, that we will be uh, looking into the wavelength as I was mentioning from about say, 800 to like 750 nanometer all that to 200 mi micron. So this is called near IR, near infrared domain, mid infrared domain and far infrared domain. So those are the kind of infrared domain will be kind of uh, uh, looking to and then uh, that this is again dispersive medium cannot do very well uh, high resolution is very bad on a this slit movement based spe basic spectrometer that is a zero order spectrometer is not very good um, resolution just because of the fact I don't know location very well 
and then use very efficient way of generating uh, the spectrum. So some of the advantages just to before you go to the um, uh, details about it, that is a non-destructive technique because you don't have to do anything with the sample. Uh, very precise uh, measurement uh, means your wavelengths are known with a very high degree of precision. Uh, much faster, you don't have to, and then when we'll, you'll see this, then we'll talk about it, then we'll uh, appreciate that there is no movement of anything. So uh, much higher increase of speed, uh, high sensitivity, uh, quickly measurement because spectroscopy if it takes like a five hours not very high throughput right if you have to move the slit one by one by one by one from say 800 nanometer to 20 micron with a 100 nanometer resolution think about how long it will take to do so for one measurement so that's kind of uh, limits the throughput so that's kind of we'll see in a minute uh, nothing mechanically moving so very simple technique uh, so again, the point here that uh, we will be uh, doing this. Instead of electronic uh, transition, we'll be measuring the bending of the bonds, uh, stretching of the bonds, uh, vibrational motion of the bonds, uh, rotational motion of the bond, translation. So these are the what we'll be measuring. So your molecule has all kinds of other way of absorbing, other way. It's not the only way that electron has to jump. That's one mechanism called electronic um, uh, transition. But there are other way light get absorbed. Right, so light comes to the material, what are the way it can absorb? That, that's what our question was, right? That's the spectroscopy, the how much light get absorbed and how much it passes through. How much it passes through, that's the only thing we can measure. How much getting absorbed in the medium, we cannot go and nanoscopically measure atom by atom. That is beyond our present capability. So, so this is what happening inside the material. Molecules, uh, the bonds are stretching, bending, uh, making some translational movement. There are a few guys, so I think there are some chairs. So, so that there are, so that point is that that in infrared domain we'll be probing all other mechanism except electronic transition, which is I think need a much higher energy. So we are kind of stuck with UV and visible domain light, where we are not uh, in the infrared domain. So we'll be kind of talking only about this kind of light matter interaction, where light excite um, this kind of stretching, bending, rotational uh, movements, which are the majority of light matter interaction apart from this uh, electronic transition. Uh, so again, uh, we'll fall back. The, uh, if you never saw a spectro, um, spectrogram or interferogram, that should show that it would take two light and then make them interfere, and that's what it looks like. So I think we, I th we should jump. Now you'll see. I have a question. Yeah. In the, how can I guess what kind of transition or movement? Or, because most of them, appear simultaneously, no? That's true, some of them. But then energies, typically, I think I, in my one slide I had, um, if I write back, then that is a, some way, that is a good question, but no direct answer. So I'm trying to see, there are some indirect way of answering that question, how to know which motion it is. So typically, um, electronic transition, delta, vibration, and delta rotation. So typically, that's what it shows. That means where your spectrum appears as a function of lambda, that tells you. So this is lower energy means the rotational uh, uh, peaks that appear farther in the infrared domain. This will be somewhere closer to the, this is definitely into the visible and UV domain. Mm -hmm. This is mid IR domain. This will be far IR domain. So if I had to make a high school guess, this is I will do this. Uh, kind of with some degree of personal confidence that so far I have. So that I will do this. Like I think it will be quite quite accurate if I have to say so. This will be this, this, and this. Again, that's, uh, we, there are a lot of exception cases. Like we can have a molecule which may not follow that thing. But I'm saying in general, it will be. Even inside solid, molecule has the room to vibrate. It, it, yeah, right. 
even even yeah so many cases rotations are favored in a liquid type of material and that's why i started my talk by water with microwave because you know water molecules rotate easily polar molecule but in a solid matrix many times molecule has no it can stretch and bend but cannot make a rotation so i started by by saying water that's true a liquid will have uh, so you can have these and the, your substrate whether it's solid and liquid so you can actually screen out and kind of zoom in what mechanism uh, is governing. A lot of gas molecules like CO2 has rotational vibrations. So lots of gas and liquid are rotation, but solid typically have vibration stretching. So these are kind of solid movement. Uh, these are more of a gas and um, liquid. Good question. So again, uh, let's not point because you may not have seen an interferometer. Uh, I'm assuming you may have seen already. This is a very popular, well-studied uh, Michelson interferometer. So we'll go slowly. So this is the light source. Light comes in, and there's a beam splitter. So beam splitter allows 50% of the light go through and 50% of the light reflects back. So it's a 50-50 beam splitter. So light 50% go, goes through, 50% goes here. So now I put two meter. One is called stationary mirror, it doesn't move. And one is a mirror which I can move, like a uh, kind of a moving mirror. So my 50% of the photon went into the moving mirror, 50% went to the stationary mirror, and then reflect back. The 50% of the uh, mirror, uh, photon now comes back, again goes through that beam splitter. 50% of that one, so 50% and 50% kind of uh, go inside, now transmit back and the uh, remaining goes back toward the another 50% off 50% goes this way so that I don't care about. So now think about the 50% went in directly into the this path also will reflect back and go through the same beam splitter. 50% will go straight back up to the source. We dump it and 50% will reflect back. So now 50% of this light, 50% of that light recombine. So that's my Michelson interferometer. So now I have a 50% of photon coming in, two, two branches of photons uh, coming in here. And uh, you can same, you can have a nice picture to show that. Like coming, go back, come in, go back, come in. You see this, this arrow, I'm just following arrow. Go straight, back, up, go straight, up, back. And they both arrive here. So now whether they will interfere constructively or destructively depend on the path length difference, right? That's what we did. So path lengths will determine the dude photon will be come on top of each other or uh, destructively interfere on top of each other. Okay. Yeah, so now that's kind of so now what my detector sees So my, so my detector sees this. So detector sitting here, two photons coming in, number one, number two coming in. Um, and then my detector actually just measuring that my detector output voltage, this voltage is proportional to my sine two pi lambda times sine 2 pi lambda plus phi because this guy comes with a little phase one of them comes with extra phase you can add one of them the phase difference I mean you can just write delta f between them delta phi right so this is my very classic sync function if you plot in your um, MATLAB so you will see that it is just a sync function symmetric sync function. This is the phase difference or, you know, phase difference um, um, is proportional to the path difference. In our case, the mirror location, the D. So you can actually see this is my D equal to zero means normally, like a both photon comes same time, so this becomes sine square. You just detect the square law addition of the photon. And now if you increase the D and you see the sync behavior, destructive interference, like a both photon coming with out of phase and detector see nothing, right? That's how uh, if you change the D, the phase, you will, you will create this sync function kind of behavior. Uh, on the, that's what detector sees for a one lambda. So we're assuming one lambda. Now, now things get a little complicated because in our case, we'll send a broadband light, which has many lambda. 
So you can assume this each lambda will create a his own sync function on top of each other. Right? Again, we'll come back to here we come a little bit later. So again, so now I have uh, Michelson interferometer and then I see that um, uh, I create this arrangement. Uh, now go back a little bit of math, not very difficult, but look like that's kind of helpful. Uh, if you did any like basic electrical engineering courses, you will understand that I'm correlating a photon with another photon. That's what correlation you are doing. So this is the same photon. In this case, is autocorrelation. So we're doing my G and P, H, both are same. So my G and H are both same photon with different phases because they arrive with a different phase because with the moving mirror, it can move back and so path. So again, hope you understood that the path, ultimately the photon coming from the source with the same photon, you divide by two, the beam splitter. So this path, so this is the path or this is the path, this is the path path 1, path 2. If they are identical, you have this normal detection at d equal to 0. But if you have path difference, now you have this constructive and destructive interfere, constructive, destructive, on that you can continue to do so. Uh, so that's what you will uh, do uh, based on the path of this path minor and this path. So, so again, so that's where the path difference, the tau come from. Uh, because of this fact that you are actually in your detector integrating the light, which is same light, but to two different paths it came from. So we have two different phases and we are integrating that, uh, that photon called autocorrelation. I think that's electrical engineering is very, uh, like we do autocorrelate with same signal all the time. Our phone, phone is all the time autocorrelating because it is getting signal of everybody. Your phone, my, everybody's phone is there, but my key is different. That's how we could decode my uh, text messages or my email because it do autocorrelation. It, 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 it is finding out my information or correlating with, again, so that's a signal processing. We can keep continuing about, but question you assume that this is what you are matching one signal with the other. In our case, G and H is same, except there's a phase difference. <sighs> then next we will do a Fourier transformation. So two operations we'll do. One is autocorrelation is automatically happening. You don't do anything. Just send the light like this arrangement in a Michelson interferometer with two different paths, this path or that path. So that automatically and light actually comes and your detector actually square law detector simply multiplying them and add them. That's the detector does. It simply uh, multiply two photon and, and integrate over a time. You detector, that's how it generates electron hole pair, right? It, it actually, you know, how if you know normal detector, how it works. Detector is simply getting same thing we talked about before that a light comes in, it creates electron and leaves a hole, and you take electron one way, hole other way, create a pin junction, and then you actually create a current. So each time photon comes in, you create an electron out and hole out. So basically then this is your circuit, and you measure the voltage. That's a detector does. So, <clears throat> so now my detector doing this autocoder means taking a one photon and trying to multiply on top of each other with the same photon with a delay in it. And then eventually we'll do a Fourier transform in it. Again, we'll go uh, why Fourier transform and why Fourier transform helped us to get the, all the signal. So I thought just to show, uh, just to remind everybody, I know everybody knows Fourier transformation. Uh, I simply just show that you have a function and you are multiplying by a uh, exponential. And, and if nobody taught you uh, what is the physical meaning of the Fourier transform and sur surprisingly, I think you will find that most people has no physical interpretation of a, how a uh, Fourier transform work. So a Fourier transform simply doing that, think about uh, you have a uh, signal, I just cannot draw too complicated, so chose a simple one. So you are, you, that's your fx, that's your, this is your f say t and this is your say, time axis t. And you have this signal, and you want to know what is the frequency component, means what are the frequency hidden here. So how, what you do, you take this and keep multiplying with various sine functions. So my y sine function, I need I, because I need to know pure tone. That's my one sine, f1. And then that's my f2, means my 2f, or second harmonic. That's my 3f. 
So what I have to do, I so I keep multiplying with a different higher harmonic. So I'm multiplying this function first with my fundamental mode and do integration. So multiply that and that's my Fourier transformation, so F, sorry. So I multiply my time domain signal with a sinusoid and I keep changing the number N. And so that I multiply first this one, that one, that one, and I'm trying to plot these higher harmonics, F, 2F, 3F, and see which one has. And you can write away, see that this is, has a F component, means it has a fundamental, you can, F could be any frequency, I didn't put a number, you see there is a F here, but you can see that there is no 2A, but there will be a 3F. And you can see that, that this actually has a third harmonic. You can see that there is a third harmonic present. So you are probing because you, you know the time domain signal and you are multiplying by your basis function, in this case a sinusoidal basis, to know what are the frequency hidden in it. Make sense? If that's how you talk to high school guy, how a Fourier transfer, but this one kind of don't show that. You just, this is the equation you always saw in our life. But if you don't know, that's what it is actually doing. So this is actually sine and cosine hidden. This E has a sine and cosine. And we add E because we want to capture not only the, uh, the, the, amp, the frequency, but also we need to know the phase because your signal may, instead of starting from like this, it can actually start like this. So it has a, at time t equal to zero, it has a phase phi. So that's the phase I want to capture. That's why you multiply it with sine and cosine both. And, and, and the sine and cosine um, uh, relation uh, will tell us the phase. So, but if you just for a high school study, you take a varying function, multiply it by the continuous varying sine wave, just like that, and you find out the frequency component. That's a Fourier transformation for high school. And then again, now in a computer, I cannot do infinity. That is not possible. Uh, you cannot even multiply sine wave, the continuous sine wave. You have to discretize. So that's called disc discrete Fourier transformation. So again, exactly same thing. That's your discrete sample because I cannot have a sine wave or any wave stored in computer. I need to have a discrete sample. Now that's my discrete sample. So that's kind of stored in the computer, and you multiply by again discrete uh, sine waves and find out the frequencies. That's for the uh, Fourier transform part. So we did that, that's how autocorrelation uh, works and that's kind of Fourier transform. The next, again this is kind of a little, uh, I, I added some little math, again very standard math, nothing um, special, but I thought it would be interesting to show that um, ultimately, uh, 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 again I just I want to show that what we are behind. We are behind that we'll be sending, we'll be sending the, uh, um, this light, separating them as you say in a Michelson interferometer. So light directly don't go to the sample, interferogram. So light coming from here and bouncing back from here. So both photon goes together. So that's what it looks like. That's my interferogram. That's my detector sees. And I do, inf and then do a Fourier transformation, I get the spectrum. So, so what I'm saying that in this mechanism, where I don't have any dispersion, I have a broadband light source which has all the frequencies over a many, many wavelength. I'm sending all of them, but my sample comes back. But now how do I know which wavelength? Because detector cannot isolate it, um, your wavelength. It simply adds all them thing up. So what we will be doing, that we will be sending an interferogram and then whatever detector reads will do the in, uh, Fourier transformation of both. So this is the interferogram because we can understand that sync function I draw for the one, one wavelength, that's what actually going to the sample and my detector measuring that as a function of location. So, so for each location, I change my moving mirror and my detector keep measuring. So that's what it is. So you can time or this is a location of the moving mirror because move, and typically is a time because mirror continuously moving. So you can imagine this is a position one, two, three, four, and you're measuring the interferogram at t equal to zero, where both photon comes in same time, no phase delay, that's a peak of the interferogram. 
and then you do FFT, a Fourier transformation to get the spectrum. As a function of wavelength, you get amplitude, uh, the spectrum. That's what we did so far, right? But for that, for normal spectroscopy, we keep sending each wavelength through this grating and, uh, and the slit. So now I know, okay, I send 1000, I measure this amplitude, the next one, and the next one, and next one, each one of them we did. But here, all simultaneously, I send, um, uh, I send the whole spectrum of light to two different paths. One go to path A, one come from path B, and all go here, detector measure, and then I change the mirror position again, do the same measurement, again measurement. So ultimately what you did, we keep sending an interferogram as a function of location of the mirror. And then I, and then I get all the data interferogram is made, my detector measured like that, and then I just do a Fourier transformation. And that gives me, the now quest, I'm trying to answer the question, what is the relation between interferogram and wavelength? So this is position of auto, this is auto correlation, right? Because I'm, that's what I'm doing. This is the same signal coming back to the detector with two different paths. One comes through this, one comes back to this. This is another path, you see that? Another path, this. So these two paths, I'm measuring the interferogram. And then after you measure the interferogram for all the position of the mirror, so all the position of the mirror, I measured the interferogram, and I took a Fourier transformation, get the spectrum. So my now five, 10 minutes, I will try to under, uh, ex kind of we all try to have some mental mathematical map that interferogram and FFT gives you the spectrum. That's the goal. Again, then we come back to a little more physical. That's just very standard textbook. So I thought instead of I didn't have time to really type myself, just copied uh, right away. So this is my going back. That is my signal doing autocorrelation of same signal on a Michelson interferometer. Uh, now, uh, so now, I, now what I'm trying to say that now I'm, in, I'm instead of dealing with one path say X uh, T and another part X star. X star basically just a general notation that in case uh, we have a phase uh, so, or no, do we have a phase? So it is a complex signal. So uh, X and X star two, they are identical but with different phase. So I put a complex conjugate sign star on top of it. And so now this is a Fourier transformation uh, um, of the uh, of one signal, one path, so path one, path two. So this is the multiplication of that. So now I can rearrange uh, the signal. Um, and I, as I said that we can always integrate the fundamental minus T2 plus two, it's like a, this two to this is enough. We don't have to, or one cycle is enough for the integration. We don't need to do int minus infinity to plus infinity for, all practical purposes, so I kind of rearrange my uh, integration uh, into that path one, xt, xs, my path two, same light. Uh, this is simply for digital signal processing people where we will be uh, having a discrete sample, so this is called expectation, you take the mean value. All of the sample, you take the mean value because each point you are sampling will have little fluctuation, right? That's how um, uh, in a digital computer sampling will we have to resample so that you take average of each each at each point. So that's called expectation. Again, you don't have to pay. This is like a normal averaging expectation operation, so we may not need need. But this more of a improve the accuracy in the computer uh, in a digital world. But now when I rearrange uh, uh, those things, my xt my light in the path one and xs light in the path two and now i kind of doing some uh, because now i have a two variable t minus s so i now give another uh, variable called tau to rearrange so now i rearrange my this variable because one changes with s path path one t and path two s basically i want to capture the path difference so i don't i didn't use same variable one is dt one is ds because both comes to different path and now you uh, rearrange uh, the thing. Now you can see that this is my E X time X S is actually nothing more than autocorrelation. Go back here. That's what the autocorrelation mean. That's my autocorrelation because this is the same amplitude coming. So I so rewrite the whole thing that this is my autocorrelation because I'm correlating X T with X T plus phase tau. That's my autocorrelation. So I, this is my read autocorrelation. Uh, then again, I need to um, uh, change back my variable called uh, change of variable. So uh, I need to go from T DT to DS space because um, uh, I need to kind of, um, and then I decided another variable tau S minus T 
and eta uh, s plus t just to you will see in a minute why that means. So now I rearrange my uh, this um, autocorrelation and we see there is a little weird integration path came out because of this uh, change of variable because one just to show in this case because you know math in a talk you cannot understand but a picture will be better to understand. So uh, in, we are integrating our original integration was minus t2 by 2 to plus t by 2 which is the whole cycle. So now you see that I was integrating my t and s that's my original variable my photon in uh, light in path 1 integrating with respect to dt light in path 2 integrating with respect to ds and then this is my path of integration my my integration area is from minus t by 2 to plus t by 2 for t as well as s but now with this change of variable my area of integration my path 1 this is my path 1 integration minus t by 2 to plus t by 2 it became here minus t to minus t to plus t so it got into this path became this path one became this one integration became that integration path two became this three became this and four became this just nothing just if you go back and look the integration that if t goes from minus t by 2 to plus t by 2 and s goes from minus t by 2 to plus t by 2 then my tau has to go minus t to plus 2 2 because I'm adding minus t by 2 to plus t by 2 2 time so minus t by 2 to minus plus t by 2 what going actually uh, minus t to plus t so basically my range of integration has changed uh, so I'm integrating area of double the size my original integration so that's my original integration uh, going back to the original raw signal uh, with this math I found my autocorrelation I'm doing over a larger area times 2 so that's my eventually factor these two into the equation so that came out to be that I divide by 2 because now I'm integrating minus t to plus t so my integration range has changed so because my original energy should be constant right it should this should be equal to that but this is not equal is double so I rather divide by 2 so that my math stays same so I divide by 2 so if you do so now eventually you say okay rearrange now all this thing and now you rearrange the bottom line now you rearrange you see that that my autocorrelation integration of this autocorrelation um, if you do the Fourier this is the you now uh, Fourier transformation of the autocorrelation right this is my autocorrelated signal Rx and Rx was like this autocorrelation x times x this is my autocorrelation so I'm now integrate my Fourier transformation of autocorrelation gives you the power spectral density which is my Fourier transform that's what it is we're looking behind so we are behind this this is my power spectral density which is basically amount of ab absorbed power as a function of wavelength that's what we found out so just to show mathematically that uh, why autocorrelation why we did autocorrelation first and then do Fourier transformation to get the spectrum this is the reason so that's the reason math also says that the Fourier transformation this is Fourier transformation you're multiplying by sine waves Fourier transformation of autocorrelation of these two light coming through two different paths actually nothing but the power spectral density which is basically absorbed power as a function of wavelength the so f is basically again f and lambda same that you just show mathematically show but now still it is not easy to convince a high schooler guy and I always believe if you cannot convince a high schooler that means we have problem your own understanding that's my always belief to be so that's still a little need math you have to understand ex uh, all the best this thingy to really go but that's not I think I feel excited about that just to prove that math that this is exactly the same thing so we, if I can autocorrelate as a function of location of the mirror and that signal each time for each tau means each path difference I measure the intensity of the light the combined light and after that in the computer I do Fourier transformation I found power absorber power reflect or whatever power as a function of wavelength that is what we are behind right in a spectrometer we plot absorption of power as a function of wavelength or transmission of power as a function of wavelength so that's what uh, we just proved but now if you go back to further down the line as a intuitive answer the so intuitive answer is that now um, uh, what we are doing now now we are doing a very simple technique that we are having a broadband light source which has all the wavelength is a function of lambda we we are actually sending 
this various wavelength through my two different paths. Path one, path two. So this is a path one and path two combined and goes through my sample. That's my sample and that's my photo detector. That is general scheme we are having so far. That is my sample. So we are sending a light, a broadband light and then after we whatever measure, photo detector simply gives me voltage as a function of location or the phase, phi, and we do FFT, Fourier transformation, we get wavelength versus power, which is absorption, transmission, uh, whatever, we, we, we find the spectrum. So this is a simple mechanism, I'm sending the power of a light source through to different path, path one, path two, and make it to recombine, go through the sample, and then I, I, my, uh, uh, my photo detector simply sum them up. So now if you think about, we're sending, so each one of them actually a pure sinusoid. We're sending a sinusoid, and you can look at the sinusoid, this spectrum is simply one line, right? It was a pure tone. The spectrum of a sinusoid simply has a one frequency component. If you keep adding complexity in it, you add more frequency. It has a fundamental harmonics and a second harmonic. In same way, if the first two harmonics are not balanced, you create a little imbalance in the spect in the time domain signal. And you can imagine that this is a more of a complex interferogram. We'll have uh, this has many wavelengths, so you can actually see that more rectangular shape. This is uh, another interferogram where you get a spectrum like that. So now, so this just to show that. But now you can imagine that you are actually sending um, a, um, a, a time domain signal. So each one of them is actually a sinusoid. So just to see, this is, each one of them is a pure tone of different frequency. You are just sending pure tone. And what actually frequency domain, you are actually sending this frequency wavelengths, individual wavelength to, you're sending through a sample. That's what actually you are doing. And that's what we want, right? I want to do that. I want to know how much my lambda one getting absorbed here and how much comes back. So I want to know lambda one, how much I send in and how much it comes back up. That's my lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, lambda n, whatever, so I got my spectrum done. But now I didn't have to separate them. I sent all simultaneously and interferogram actually took care of it. That means with physical understanding that I'm sending a light, which is a broadband, it already has all the individual light component of different wavelength. And when they go through the whole process, I'm just measuring each one of them individually through this, this correlation um, and interferometric technique. That, so what, what is the advantage now? That I don't need to separate them. Like previously I need a prism to separate them and which is very inefficient mechanism to do such a long wavelength. Here I don't do anything like that. I just send the white light, a broadband light and the interferometer because of the whole interference process it actually uh, individually, you can imagine that is actually sample seeing one after one after one as a function of wavelength, and you are just measuring them. Uh, question about the, the movement of the meter. Core. Is there a condition for the right? Is it a, a step movement? Right, I'll come into in a second, yes, sure. So that just a matter of physically to convince your grandma how a Michael's interferometer work. But now, the question now, next logical question is what is the path, uh, is all discrete path, like the mirror moves only in discrete steps. So this is, uh, again, I have to go back. They move, mirror move in a discrete, because, you know, it's a, a digital stages, so it moves lambda, uh, little by little, so defined steps, few, na few tenths of a nanometer at a single time, the discrete steps. So what people do uh, to know exact location, so, in, so this is an incoherent light source which you want to measure. So apart from that, the clever way of doing, apart from all of light they go through, they send a pure tone. They send a red LED, a red, red laser actually. So this is a red laser going through. Lambda 633 nanometer. It goes through the same process because now I'm sending a one pure tone. Uh, now my pure tone, when it goes through the interferometer, it interferes and creates this uh, kind of I, we, I kind of drawn before, right? That's a zero crossing. You interfere a two beam, you create this thingy. 
uh, rippling effect. Um, so now you can actually see that each time it zero crosses, that's your condition. That my d, the path difference is n times lambda 1, uh, and the next will be n plus 1, lambda 2. So you can just each point you pick it up. So now each point of, so you exactly know the location. So now you can actually know your lambda is simply a multiplier. So your lambda is simply a path difference divided by an integer. And because you're sending a laser, so your, your measurements of that d is much accurate because I know the wavelength very accurately for a Heaney laser, which is 633.3 which is very accurate measurement. So you know, uh, because measure, again, next question was, not easy to measure D. D, position measurement is always a problem, even today. To, because we can say, this is one meter apart, but okay, for scientifically, you are measuring through light. For light, one meter is a whole universe. So even a fraction of a nanometer difference between your measurement, light could be, your whole interferometer will be completely gone. So, but this one is known as so stable, also stability, because light source is not stable. Each time temperature changes, your emission changes. So, along with the light, original light source, we send a, a red laser, which actually does the same thing. It goes through the two beam and the interfere and create this interference pattern. And the, if you uh, still need, I didn't have uh, uh, that math uh, plotted, but you can go back to a basic uh, uh, hect book on optics, it will simply sum up sine theta plus sine theta 2 and you'll get a sync kind of a sync function and, and the separation between them, the zero crossing or the maxi peak location is by this, this relation where this to this is D, which is my phase difference, the path difference. So if I know the lambda very accurately through my laser, I know exact path difference. So I can calculate back. So that's how you actually uh, can map back your wavelength as a function of amplitude. Again, little uh, FTI, a little uh, complicated thing, I need a little understanding. So keep thinking about it, so that we are, instead of sending many wavelengths, we send interferogram to the sample. And each interferogram actually has different wavelength hidden in it. So light will absorb differently in your material based on the lambda. And when it comes back, your photo detector sum them up and then you do FFT for each location of your interferogram and, and that gives you, and that we've proved mathematically that this is autocorrelation, FFT gives you the spectrum. So without sending many wavelength. Now can you explain that to your grandma? That's a challenge. <laughs> no, that's challenge. Take it as a good um, exercise actually. I always believe that anything you cannot explain to your grandma, that means we, you never understood. So that's, uh, that's my always belief. Um, is, uh, this is complicated, it's a lot of physical you know, thinking that why I'm sending a broadband light and suddenly I'm getting a spectrum back. So it needs that kind of little way of imagining yourself uh, what is, it does. But anyway, for the sake of time, we have to uh, move on. So that's how uh, uh, nice, just to this is more a practical uh, path uh, of a, uh, inter in a FTIR where you send the light through. Again, you have to collimate that is simply a broadband incoherent light source. You have to collimate the beam, otherwise you will diverge. Path length will be different. Makes sense, right? Your diverging beam, you want both to have a control pathway. But if light goes to this way and some goes to that way, then the path length you may not be knowing accurately. So make sure we have to collimate the beam very well both paths so that light coming through this path or light coming through this path, both as a known path difference just based on the mirror location location, the moving mirror location, this one that moves. So that gives you the spectrum. So this is more of a uh, generalistic, uh, nice uh, way of showing that, um, that that's how the uh, interferogram goes to the sample and the detector. So now interesting, that means you don't send the light directly to the sample. UVVs, we did that one-to-one -one mapping, light in, light out, light in, light out. But here I'm not doing, I'm sending all light same time and using math to take care of it. Not very clever, I think. Whoever, uh, I think, I don't know who is, uh, Parkin Elmer first launched it, but I don't know is there any uh, inventor for that. Probably they are using electrical engineering autocorrelation for a long time, so they knew that. So probably somebody, um, I don't think somebody's name attached to that, but very clever way of doing so, which really changed the way we measure the uh, many things now. We, that uh, UVVs technique is a very limited technique, but this is a wide open, and so simple uh, uh, technique to do. 
just in a spectrogram. Okay, now moving forward, you need to know the. Uh, uh, I wish I wanted to have this could be a three hour talk and go back to the sine function. That's what I love to go nail further, but look like we're to move on, have a bigger picture. So, uh, question is now uh, uh, for a uh, more of an actual spectrometer point of view, what are the detectors? This is the most critical part. You see, this is very simple part, there's nothing in it. What is in it? A beam splitter, a mirror which can move. And that's it, there's nothing, and there's a bulb. It's a $2 uh, light bulb, any bulb can do that. Even torch flash lamp will do the same thing. People actually take a coil, like a, a copper coil, and, and send a current through it, and you generate enough infrared light, you don't need. So this is nothing, this is nothing, this is all nothing. This is actual thing, the detector. Because infrared domain, not many detectors available. So two to type of detector uh, use, one is called pyroelectric detector, um, uh, DTGS, uh, called deuterated triglyceride sulfate and one is a photon detector typically a mercury cadmium telluride uh, again we'll come back in a minute again you can read later at your home point it is that a pyroelectric detector actually pyroelectric means inside a voltage if you apply a voltage that material get polarized means um, um, a pyroelectric material has a get a polarized means <laughs> it is a material where you apply a voltage, so this is a piece of material, you apply a voltage across, you make the material polarized. And then when infrared radiation comes in, it resistance changes. Because the polarization of the molecule changes with the heat you generate, and that changes the resistance. So basically, what are you measuring? You are measuring a your voltmeter is measuring your voltage output is proportional to delta R and delta R is proportional to your absorption of infrared light. That's what you're doing. So basically you're measuring a voltage which is change of uh, resistance of the film as a function of uh, uh, amount of light you absorb. That's a very simple thermal detector and you can imagine that not very sensitive because the, these temperature dependent things are very slow, uh, not very accurate, means the mapping of this like infrared light power versus uh, delta R is not very linear uh, uh, accurate mapping means and, and the slope is very low means it needs enough more than enough infrared light to make a change. So basically <coughs> anything small change it cannot detect. So very um, uh, first order detector and not do very well. Uh, that's a DTGS. Uh, but then next step of detectors, which are semiconductor detector, uh, like uh, some of them are, Mar this is a more popular one, Marcatel, uh, Mercury Cadmium Telluride, uh, uh, and then uh, Indium Interminide. Uh, so those are kind of different wavelength ranges. So typically, uh, INSB, Indium Interminide, uh, can go from about say 900 nanometer, well about say 2 micron, that's indium, INSB. And then above all of those to up to say 20 micron, the best detector still is MCT, which is mercury cadmium telluride. Uh, so again, the, what is the problem here now? Problem you see right away that they are band gap because I'm trying to measure a photon. Look at the photon energy. Is we're talking about say 20, 20, 20 milli electron volt to maybe um, uh, 50, 60 milli electron volt. So we're measuring very small energy measurement in infrared domain. The photons are very small energy. So now, so to, to detect again, going back to our original concept, I need a very my energy is weak means I need a narrow band gap material, right? We, we talked about it. This E2 minus E1 equal to has to be H nu. H nu which is equal to H nu. If H nu is weak means I need a narrow band gap material. But the narrow, this is a very narrow 20 milli, milli electron volt uh, band gap compared to a so silicon which is 1.1 1 .1, uh, electron volt. We're talking about so silicon is a about 1.1 EV versus MCT, which is such as 1,000 times less. But now what happened, you have a narrow band gap material that even without having any infrared radiation, your electron make transition, just for thermal vibration. Because it has background energy, it is a band gap is so low, the electron always jumping back and forth. 
because you call background fluctuations. Always the background is fluctuating. That means my dark current is very high. Means without even a light, I have a current. Means I don't know whether I'm measuring light or not measuring light because of that pack. So what to do that? That you have to cool this material called cryogenically cool. Means you have to cool temperature down to say 77 Kelvin, liquid nitrogen temperature. Otherwise, your background fluctuation at room temperature is so high that you are measuring like a noise all the time. So that's a big problem that uh, we cannot, um, uh, many cases, that's what making the infra FTIR more expensive. All the components are few hundred dollars, but this one, we're talking about thirty thousand, fifty thousand dollars or whatever. That's what that makes infrared detection or FTIR more uh, expensive because of the fact we're detecting a very weak photons. Uh, we need a different approach. Just to show uh, how it look like, uh, that's kind of a measuring a transmission. So these are the energy get absorbed in the material and you create this very unique uh, fingerprint um, uh, of a um, kind of a uh, um, of, of that material and you measure as a function of wavelength. Just to give some uh, uh, real life example, we're measuring, uh, I think I'm a backup. So this is my measuring uh, say oxygen carbon dioxide, water, methane, and all have very distinct wavelength uh, absorption peak. It's a function of wavelength and we can, we can attribute as, you, as soon as you match the spectrum, we can say this is uh, oxygen or methane. Again, I think just to wrap up, uh, what is the advantages uh, of uh, FTIR uh, compared to um, a normal spectrometer? A simple mechanical design, we saw that. Uh, no mirror, no dispersion, no moving um, of the slit. Um, uh, and also the stray light problem because you know, you know, in your, in your um, uh, grating or uh, prism design of a spectrometer, other light coming from the other places uh, um, kind of make the measurement noisy. But here we are doing a Fourier transformation of the everything and, and going to the interferometer, stray light will not interfere uh, nicely, they'll cancel out. So uh, we are very robust. Uh, again, very powerful technique, uh, sensitive, very sensitive, fast because you are not sending one wavelength at a time, one, 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 you are just doing all simultaneously, so very fast. Um, and again, you are studying wide range of molecule, do their chemical bond based absorption, not just electronic absorption as we talked about. So now that's advantages, but in this world there's nothing called perfect, right? You, anything has advantage should come to disadvantage too, right? Anything, a good car, disadvantage expensive. It takes money out of the bank account. So you always have some disadvantages. Uh, now it, it cannot detect atoms or monoatomic ions single. Think about, we're looking for a bond, but now monoatom cannot be detected very well because it has no bond. How do you measure, say, um, argon? It is a monoatom, right? You cannot, it has no stretching, bonding, nothing. So it has some limitation content, no chemical bonds. There's no chemical bonds means you cannot measure, uh, cannot detect molecules comprised of two identical atoms, symmetric. Like this is very symmetric, nitrogen or oxygen, it's symmetric. So you, you need asymmetry of uh, motion, um, doesn't do very well. Um, uh, and then aqua solutions are very difficult to analyze. So like a, uh, because you know, you know, water, you cannot do very good infrared spectrogram, uh, uh, spectra FTIR, because water inherently absorb uh, infrared light. You have an aqueous solution. You put a salt in a some kind of salt, say lead selenide, in a water. But now you have problem because your water will absorb uh, ma majority of infrared light. So now, but uh, which I don't want, right? I want only my lead salt should absorb light, not the water. But now your spectrum is completely get uh, changed because of the presence of water. So water create a big problem. So it has a lot of absorption band, just to be clear, you understand. Think about, you want to measure that, but you have a water absorb 100% of light across that. Now it will have a big spectrum of water. So now lead cylinder also has absorption here. Now you cannot know whether lead cylinder absorbing or water absorbing. May, water may have a big absorption here, all along. So all the spectral features of lead cylinder gone. Because now you don't know this is water absorbing or lead cylinder absorbing. So it's kind of limits us from those kind of, uh, again, sometimes it's complex mixture samples that rise to complex. But yeah, so if you have very complex mixture, you get very complex spectrum because one of them will have this. Now you have five, six different salt mixture on top of together. They will have uh, resonances on top. So it's kind of difficult to isolate them. So 
again this is very nothing this cannot be avoided because this is uh, can inherently like that so again just to go back to uh, my last for the FTIR uh, this kind of widely used uh, spectroscopic technique for inorganic and organic components uh, and compounds uh, unknown mixtures can be identified without some some restriction um, you can do solid liquid gases uh, do a lot of remote sensing like send the light on the top that's how they do to the environment and then whatever light comes through they do full uh, FTIR and then measure the pollution on the air in Medellin say you, you, you can send a big light across from uh, uh, university from here to somewhere downtown and then you measure the reflected light or you put a detector and lay light uh, far apart and you measure the say uh, remote uh, pollution measurement uh, then you, that's what mentioning atmospheric spectra uh, you can measure solar spectrum uh, on earth at various on top of mountain on top of Guatape will be a different solar spectrum versus on the on, on the ground on, on this valley um, so um, again a lot of deep space based satellites uses uh, FTIR for data analysis so that kind of says that FTIR is a one of the strong uh, spectroscopic techniques. So before you go to Raman tomorrow, I think we should stop uh, today because we kind of completed. So I'll be happy if you have more question uh, to talk about. Right, you, you want to know the quantified, the, so again, to some extent you can do again a Beer Lambert law because that is general law where you can actually know the path length and if the medium is homogeneous, you can actually calculate how much light has been lost. So again, if you go back a spectrum like this, you know that you launch 100% of the light at that wavelength around say a wave number of, of 1000. 1100 and you know that ultimately you got back maybe about 15 percent light back so 85 percent of light has been lost so you can go back to Baird Lambert law and actually plug in and if you know you need to know one either you need to know the concentration or the path length and you can calculate that how much absorption because absorption is 85 percent and you know the path length you can find out concentration or if you know concentration you can find out the path length so you can do similar way analysis, but again with the constraint that it has to be homogeneous medium, all of those things we talked about in the morning. Why it is not used at uh, higher frequencies? Why only IFR? That's a good question. I, I was I'm hoping that, yeah, that's a good question. Can we do FTIR um, in the UV uh, V's domain? Um, um, uh, that's kind of a... Uh, nice question. Uh, people, I never saw um, a FTIR in the visible domain, uh, but I, in principle, uh, there should not be any um, uh, issue uh, except the fact that um, uh, if I go back to uh, if I go back to the this part, uh, the the issue we always encounter that the source which spans the visible domain cannot span the infrared domain. Uh, so, but, and many times, so typically in my lab, which actually we do a lot of FTR in the visible domain, and then we, we do visible domain FTR all the time from 400 nanometer onwards, uh, but we, we have to, to, we have a two different source, one in the infrared domain and one into the UV visible domain, and also the detector, so detector need to be changed because the detector works in the infrared domain, doesn't do at all, because the band gap is huge, so doesn't detect anything in the visible domain, so what we do, now you ask a very interesting question, so let me uh, give some realistic, honest answer. Otherwise, you'll think that I just said something and try to end. So what I we do at FTIR uh, because I wanted to do visible domain FTIR. So now we call it UV is FTIR. It's not very common. So when I joined and started my group, um, and then we had to really buy everything separately. So we have a source which covers UV to visible light um, and then we had to have a detector so this is I have a gap detector 
gallium phosphide is a wide band gap so it actually goes from about a 350 nanometer about to 450 nanometer then we have a visible domain we have a silicon detector which goes from a 400 nanometer all the way to 1.1 micrometer then we now that is uv base and then at the in infrared domain in ir mid ir domain we have uh, mct which actually spans about 900 nanometer to all the way to 18 micron so we need we have three detectors and two sources. The so sources have a visible source, um, which actually, um, and the, that is a photo detector and PD. And the source, we have two different ones. Uh, one goes from uh, about, say, 400 nanometer to, is a visible source. So basically, you can think about 800 nanometer or so. And one is IR a domain which goes uh, from, say, 700 nanometer all the way to, say, I don't know, maybe 50 micron. A glow bar. Glow bar simply a coil heating up the coil. It create a lot of white. If you pl plot the Planck uh, distribution, it actually goes like that as a function of lambda. So it has all the wavelength. But for visible domain, we need it because that doesn't very do very well in this visible domain. So we have a separate detect uh, source. So we need that kind of thing. On top of that, still we have a problem. Still our our did um, uh, I can still disappointed after spending maybe $100,000 just to get this thing. I wanted to do visible domain of TIR, as you may mention, but still we can only do very well uh, visible domain only from 540 nanometer all the way to 18 micron. Below that I cannot. So problem is that the way they choose the optics, they are IR coated for infrared lights. So it allows infrared light goes through very well and it cuts off the visible light. So still, after having separate source, separate detector, uh, our uh, FTIR doesn't do very well below four, uh, 550 or 4, 5, 30 nanometer because of those things they are designed to work. You know, everything has to be uh, anti-reflection coated. Otherwise, your light get reflect from each interfaces. So we lose a lot of light. But again, yes, same principle. So people, just due to the cost and this problem, it took me four months work with Brooker Optics uh, we designed ourselves together with me. I said I want a visible domain FTIR, but they don't sell. They say their FTIR is designed from 900 nanometer above all that wavelength range, up to 100 micron. But if you want a visible component, you need to change this. So you have to have all this detector, a gap detector for UV light, gallium phosphide white band gap detector, a silicon detector for visible light, and a MCT mercury cadmium telluride for infrared domain. That's a very good question though.